For Crema Media in Johannesburg, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Media Liaison and Communication Officer at Motor Industry Staff Association, Sonia Carstens, to discuss issues affecting the retail motor industry. So MESA is a trade union representing employees in the retail and motor industry. Uh, typically, what level of employee do you represent and how many members do you have? We've got more than 55,000 members, literally from the bottom throughout the, the, the sectors. So we've got fuel attendants up to retail managers. What is your view of, of government's review of uh, South Africa's fuel price and methodology? And what could be done uh, to better reduce the fuel prices in the country? Well, biggest concern is, is that government is cu currently dragging its feet. You would recall that the Minister of Finance already announced in December last year that there was going to be a review of the fuel pricing methodology. And with the fuel pricing methodology, we mean the percentage of money that goes to the various taxes. So we've got three rand 89 cents going towards general tax, two rand 18 cents going towards the road accident fund, and then we've got another two rand 29 cents going towards the retailer. That's the person collecting the tax on behalf of government. But in between, we've got different other levies as well. You know, Transnet gets a levy out of that, also for the pipe, use of the pipelines, etc. So they said they're going to review it, and it was long before Russia invaded the Ukraine. But, mm -hmm. but it never happened. In, in the minister's budget vote, when he, when, when he was addressing us in February, he once again uh, made the allowance to say, we won't have an increase in taxes, but we will review the taxes. But then came, came March and Russia invaded Ukraine. The problem with that is that the fuel price skyrocketed and it's an international uh, price. So there's nothing government can do to control that, but government can lessen the burden by taking away the taxes. Now, currently, government is one of the options they are considering is deregulating 93, the mm. petrol only, but 93, not 95. Mm. That would, in effect, uh, mean that only people living in, inside the country, so no, not the coastal areas, only us are using 93, would be have deregulated, but then retailers would be able to compete with each other to provide motorists with cheaper fuel. In essence, it sounds like a wonderful idea. But now mm -hmm. I've got one fuel station and you've got seven. You are able to buy your fuel in bulk and provide it at a much cheaper price. I won't be able to do the same. So for my 2 Rand 29 that I used to get out of the, the liter, I'm now going to look at my operational cost and what am I going to do? I'm going to cut back and I'm going to cut back on labor. So I'm going to uh, change my system similar to, this, to the systems we've got in the United States where mm -hmm. you go inside the shop, you put, let's say, a thousand rand on the pump. That's what you're going to put into your car and you throw in that petrol yourself. No longer a use for a fuel attendant. The fuel attendance in South Africa, we've got 52,743. That was the figure from the Motor Industry Bargaining Council just last week. So you can imagine that will have a massive impact on those jobs. And we can't afford more unemployment. The other alternative is where do government then go? Where, where can we find another source? And that's the road accident fund. You know that the Road Accident Fund has always been controversial. Um, mm. Always there, there has been the, a question about corruption, fraud. Um, are the ma money actually going to victims or are they reaching, enriching the pockets of people in this, in this whole supply chain, including attorneys, medical personnel, you know, abusing the victims? And we've never actually done a proper study on that so, so so that's one option and then the other option is going to another source 
to find that you know um de- uh, to, to to leave the leave the the, the, ta- the take away the tax from from the fuel but but get that m- money into the fiscus from somewhere else and that's that's only one place where we can now go and that's the taxi industry the taxi industry is a 90 billion rand industry that's according to the statistics of last year but it only paid 5 million towards tax so obviously a non-regulated industry and that's where the loss is that's where we should start collect revenue Mm. and the organization has also like expressed its frustration at the minister of mineral resources Gwede Mantashe, for not being included in the task team that has to work on these issues related to fuel prices do you think you will add value should you be included uh, in this team? We actually got a letter from the minister confirming that we will be included in the team. But mm-hmm. the problem with that is that the team, the team has not been compiled yet. The minister's office is still busy uh, uh, reviewing the criteria for this committee that will be, lo- be looking at this. Now, <laughs> reviewing the, ca- the criteria, we're already in July. The, the fuel pro- price started skyrocketing in March. And, and on ground level, each and every South African is suffering. I mean, the price of fertilizer went up with 400%. The price of grain went up with 300%. So that's having an impact on ordinary people. Now we bring the fuel price into this, uh, this picture. And you can just imagine your bucket of what you are used to pay for that amount of groceries. Mm. You, you will at the end of the day walk out with only a loaf of bread and a, 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 a litre of milk. And that's what we are afraid, afraid of. The poverty in our country is already so bad. We can't mm. afford this and we have to act fast. And, and the minister has got no urgency in his actions. And now, Sonia, given the looming water crisis that is playing out in Nelson Mandela Bay, you are also concerned that your members uh, may be impacted uh, somehow. How do you think your members will be impacted? And do you have like solutions that you can put out there to, to those who are working on that issue? We, we got a question from our members to ask that if I'm on a list, in a suburb to go and collect my water for the day let's say between 10 and 12 on this time of the day i need to go and collect my my ratio of water that government is going to provide me what am i to do must my employer allow me to go and collect my water we did um, uh, uh, put in uh, uh, inquiries to the Department of Labor and the Department of Water and Sanitation. And mm. the response was very disappointing. The Department of Labor referred us to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and the Labor Relations Act. But those acts all give an obligation to the employer to provide a safe working environment, to ensure that you've got running water at the office, to drink some water, to use at the toilets, etc. But there's no provision for what's going to happen at home. It's not the employer's problem. So at the end of the day, it boils down to government made no extra provision or issued no official guidelines for employers that would assist employees in this situation. So if you need to go and stand and collect your bucket of water, let's say between 10 and 10 and 12, you're going to have to take annual leave or unpaid leave. Um, and that's also a very difficult situation. You can imagine that at the end of the day, taking a day of annual leave, how long is your leave going to last? And then you don't have leave anymore. And you're also not going to be able to go and collect uh, your bucket of water in another suburb they are going to make provision for you where you are staying. And that's where you're going to need to to collect your water. So so it's it's very disappointing and concerning that government have have not looked at this picture in a broader sense, realized that the current legislation are there to, you know, to regulate the workplace, but not regulate a unique situation like this. 
And, and they can't say they haven't been warned. We had a very similar situation in 2018 when the Western Cape was heading for Daisyero. The floods that uh, we witnessed in KZN and in April, how were your members affected? Severely. As you know, the whole Toyota plant was flooded. Um, a part of that plant could only reopen on the 23rd of May. But the, the, the majority of vehicles are not yet being manufactured at that plant. And I think there was, they were only able to save like 15% of the vehicles that was already ready for distribution. So the rest had to be scrapped. The reality is that you don't have the Yotas in land. So the prices mm. of second-hand vehicles has escalated. So you, for in, in instance, are wait, waiting for Fortuner, and now you mm. can't get your new Fortuner, so you go and buy second-hand. But now the second-hand dealer can charge you whatever he, he or she wants to because there's no, there's no stock in the market. Mm. So that had a, had a, had a knock-on effect. And then obviously some of the dealerships ran out of stock. So um, if you don't have stock, you can't sell a car and you can't earn commission. Um, uh, vehicle salespeople work on commission. That's, that's the main source of their income. And if there's no stock, there's no um, commission. So the, the flats had a very, very severe impact on them. We don't see a drop in vehicle sales. In fact, we've seen a, a, a very steep climb in, in vehicle sales, in used vehicle, used cars, as well as in new cars. After COVID-19, as we, we call it, um, we, it's the, as though people were waiting, you know, where they used to replace a car within four years. They now waited for six years, seven years, perhaps, just to get them through the pandemic, maybe a salary cut. But they are coming back and they are purchasing cars again, new cars, new cars and used cars. So, so that's, that's not the problem. The problem is that the stock's limited. And when stock is limited, your price mm-hmm. increases. And were you perhaps able to identify as to what can be, can be done in future? Should this flood okay in case it's and again? The reality is that with climate change, the, the, the likelihood of, you know, floods in KZN, but basically we are very, uh, very, very, very open to any time, type of national, uh, natural disaster. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and with that as well, um, the, the future, um, especially in the retail motor industry, would be to invest in electric vehicles. But now, and that's the irony of this, and, and sorry for laughing, but we say invest in electric vehicles. We say that, you know, lessen our carbon footprint because we are obliged to do so by 2050. South Africa must have a, a, zero, a, a zero carbon emission um, in terms of the international conventions we sign. But now we've got ESCOM and unlimited load shedding nonstop. Now, now imagine you had an electric vehicle and you go to the plug. Yeah. So we, we are in a bit of a catch-22. At the end of the day, we need to save the planet. But mm-hmm. in South Africa, with ESCOM on our side, there's no way we will save anything because we can't switch to electric vehicles. It's simply impossible. A union, I think it's SAPO, has threatened to take Standard Bank to court uh, following Standard Bank's policy on the issue of vaccination. But now they've suddenly derailed because uh, they said 95% of their employees are now vaccinated. So how has been uh, in your industry in terms of vaccination policy? In our in our industry, they haven't yet forced any employee to, to, to go for a vaccination. But uh, one must also look at the judgments from coming from the CCMA to date has been contradicting each other. You know, um, uh, so many were saying, no, you, you have to be vaccinated. Others were saying, no, it's not necessary. You can't force him for you to be vaccinated. And that's actually only an issue that will have to be taken on right through to the Constitutional Court. 
so that we can get legal clarity. But 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 also, you know, um, I think any employer today trying to force employees to be vaccinated must think twice because. Um, yes, it's still a national disaster, but we're no longer wearing masks. So we're looking at what COVID-19 has come in South Africa, the, the need, the urgency to force people to, to, to ignore their religious beliefs, etc., um, and medical, me, medical conditions. It, it, it's no longer there. And I don't think the, the courts will necessarily entertain that. But it's, a, it's an issue that we need legal clarity on and the constitutional court at the end of the day must decide. And lastly, Sonia, how did the, the COVID restrictions uh, like mask wearing impacted your industry? And what has been like now that all these uh, COVID restrictions uh, have been lifted? I, I must say our industry um, uh, were, were severely affected by COVID-19. We lost... 2,000 jobs in our industry, um, dealerships that had to close down, people took salary uh, uh, cuts just to, to keep the dealerships going. That has not yet been rectified. That's one of the demands we've got at the Motor Industry Bargaining Council this year that we are saying, employer, we passed COVID-19 now, so you need to pay employees what they used to earn prior to COVID-19 because vehicle sales are booming in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think that the whole frustrating thing was, you know, you, you talk to, to, to someone, you work underneath a car, you try and sell a car firstly, and you try and talk to a client with this mask on. And now you have to, you, you're a mechanic, you're underneath the car and you're trying to work with a mask on. You, you, in, the, in the bonnet of the car with a mask on, it was very difficult and very frustrating. And I think overall, um, and I'm not only speaking for our industry, but I think overall joy that we can now have a South Africa again mask free and you know breathe fresh air. There was Sonia Carstens in conversation with Polity to discuss issues affecting the retail motor industry.